you don't want to automate your tyrannical masters. And that's the danger. That's yeah. one of the dangers of AI. And this is a whole new kind of monster. And maybe it's already here. What's your position on artificial intelligence, potential positive and negative outcomes, and general sense of what it will mean for hu hmm? humanity? humanity those, over, those people? Over the next five years. Five years, that's all. Well, my position basically is we better get our act together before the giants show up. And they're like knocking at the door right now. So you better build your ark, folks, and get on your adventure because we're whipping up some things in the lab that will make everything that's come so far look like nothing's happened at all yet. And that's, that's not like next year, that's tomorrow, that's now. So we're gonna have a lot of things to contend with. Well, is there Jim's objection seems to be yeah. something like we're, we're making, we may be making when we're doomsaying, let's say, and I'm, I'm not saying there's no place for that. We're making the presumption of something like a, a zero sum competitive landscape, right? Is that the, the idea and the idea behind movies like, like uh, The Terminator is that there is only so much resources and the machines and the human beings would have to fight over it. And you can see that that, that could easily be a preposterous assumption. Now, I, I think that, that one of the fundamental points you're making, though, is also um, there will definitely be people that will weaponize AI. And those weaponized AI systems will have as their goal something like the destruction of human beings, at least under some circumstances. And then there's the possibility that that will get out of control because the most effective systems at destroying human beings might be the ones that win, let's say. And that, that could happen independently yeah. of whether or yeah. not it is a true zero sum competition. Well, we'll see. I mean, Elon Musk, one of the things he's working on, see, he, he thinks that the world will be controlled by whoever produces the most functional AI system the fastest because there'll be a first, a first mover advantage. And one of the things Musk has been working on for a long time are distributed AI systems so that you'll have your own artificial intelligence to protect you against, well, let's say against Google's artificial intelligence for starters. Yeah, or, or the CCP's artificial intelligence, because you can bet your hat they're working on that about as fast as they possibly can. But I wonder if that's part, partly a consequence of the erroneous maximization of short-term desire. I mean, one of the things that you might think about that could be dangerous on the AI front is that we optimize the manner in which we, inter we interact with our electronic gadgets to capture short-term attention, right? Because there's a difference between getting what you want right now, right now, yeah. and getting what you need in some more mature sense across a reasonable span of time. And one of the things that does seem to be happening online, and I think it is driven by the development of AI systems, is that we're, we're assaulted by systems that parasitize our short-term attention. Yeah. and at the expense of longer term attention. And I, if the AI systems emerge to optimize attentional grip, it isn't obvious to me that they're going to optimize for the attention that works over the medium to long run, right? They're gonna, they're gonna be, they could conceivably maximize something like whim-centered. I mean, one of the things I was talking to Dr. Penrose today about was, He believes that consciousness, in some sense, stands outside the domain of algorithmic computation. I know he does, yes. And we discussed in some detail why he believes that. And I'm very curious about that. My brother-in-law is probably the world's foremost computer chip designer. Okay. And he's currently designing a chip that he thinks will have the computational power of a human brain. And he was the first person to build a 64-bit chip, and he did okay. that in 1985. Okay. And so we've had a lot of discussions about the limits of AI. So this is an AI-optimized chip, by the yes. way. This and is my, my brother-in-law thinks that computation is algorithmic. 
and so it's compu- or that 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 thought is computational yeah. and algorithmic, and it can be replicated in AI yes. systems. Yeah. Penrose thinks that Gödel's theorem precludes that; that there has to be something standing outside. Yes. Now, I tried to push him on what he regarded as the metaphysical significance of consciousness. One of my hypotheses, let's say, about deep stories is that they're 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 metagists in some sense. So you could imagine a hundred people telling you a tragic story, and then you could reduce each of those tragic stories to the gist of the tragic story, and then you could aggregate the gists, and then you'd have something like a meta tragedy. And I would say. The deeper the gist, the more religious-like the story gets, and that's part of it's that idea is part of the reason that I wanted to bring you guys together. I mean, one of the things that what you just said makes me wonder is: imagine that you took Shakespeare, and you took Dante, and you took like the the canonical Western writers, and you trained an AI system to ex- to mm-hmm. understand the structure of each of them, and then and now you have you could pull out. The summaries of those structures, the gists, and then couldn't you pull out another gist out of that? So it would be like the okay. essential element of Dante and Shakespeare. And They're always after the next new thing as fast as possible. So it's a machine that's speeding along as fast as a machine possibly can, and and. God only knows where it's headed in some sense, right? Because there's so many things happening at the same time that it's impossible to keep track, and we don't even know what these things are, like the the autonomous cars that are being developed. You know, people still think about those as cars, but that isn't what they are. They're autonomous, self-learning robots, and the fact that they happen to take the form of cars at the moment is almost irrelevant. You know, they're no more cars than cars were horseless buggies. Right, they're a whole new thing. Because one of the things that's happening now is, we're, as you pointed out earlier, is we're going to be producing equally revolutionary transformations, but at a much smaller scale of time. And so, Mike, one of the things I wonder about, I think it's driving some of the concerns in the conversation, is: Are we going to be intelligent enough to? Direct with regulation the transformations of technology as they start to accelerate. Well, I mean, we've yeah. we've already. You look what's happened online. I mean, we've inadvertently, for example, ra- radically magnified the voices of narcissists, psychopaths, and Machiavellians, and we've done that so intensely. Partly, and I would say, partly as a mm-hmm. conserva- consequence of AI mediation. When people were first developing models of artificial intelligence, they thought they'd be able to develop machines that sort of modeled the world, and then figured out how to act in the world, sort of abstractly, and then would, after they figured out how to act in the world, would then act in the world. But that proved to be impossible, as you can tell, because we don't have, you know, ambulatory robots that could like bus tables at a at a restaurant, which turns out to be, by the way, a very complex job. Fast mathematical operations. Computer can handle that easily, or easily, but busing a table? It's like no computer is smart enough to do that. So that's pretty peculiar. But it turned out after like 40 years of investigation that you couldn't build computers that would operate as independent robots by teaching them to model the world, and then by having them model the potential action that they were going to undertake, and then by implementing it. That did not work, partly because modeling the world. Is way more complicated than anybody ever suspected. It's like infinitely more complicated. And what's really interesting about robots like that is that they basically ha- they're all identical, right? More or less. And what that means is that when one learns something, every one of them learns it at the same time. And so even if they're not very bright, if there's 10 million of them, or 100 million of them, and they're all learning one thing a day. That's a hundred million new things a day that every one of them is learning, and so they're mapping the road and they're learning how to operate in a natural environment, which is a really big deal. Like it's a really, really big deal. They're learning to map the perception of the world onto action, which is really the definition, a, re- a good definition in some sense of intelligence. You know, you hear babies have no theory of mind. It's like, ah,、uh, yeah, no, they can imitate. 
that's pretty bloody amazing, man. Like you haven't seen robots that can do that yet. Although there are robots now that you can teach by moving their, their arms. You move their arms and then they'll do it. And so you can actually program them by moving them and then they'll just repeat it. And so they're getting damn close to imitation. They're really getting close and then look the hell out, man. Because they're going to be imitating each other as well as us. And they're going to do it so fast, you just won't be able to believe it. So that's coming. Now, AIs, you know, it's a threat too. But if we, if, we were, if we had our act together ethically, it's possible that AI could become a, a useful servant rather than a tyrannical master. You don't want to automate your tyrannical masters. And that's, the danger, that's yeah. one of the dangers of AI. You know, the guys that are building the autonomous cars, like they don't think they're building autonomous cars. They know perfectly well what they're doing. They're building fleets of mutually intercommunicating autonomous robots. And each of them will be able to teach the other because their nervous system will be the same. And when there's 10 million of them, when one of them learns something, all 10 million of them will learn it at the same time. So they're not going to have to be very bright before they're very, very, very smart. Because us, you know, we'll learn something. You have to imitate it. It's like, God, that's hard. Or I have to explain it to you and you have to understand it and then you have to act it out. We're not connected wirelessly with the same platform. But robots, they are. And so once those things get a little bit smart, they're not gonna stop at a little bit smart for very long. They're gonna be unbelievably smart, like overnight. Everyone in Silicon Valley is rushing to produce artificially intelligent systems, which are being tried out in 50 different ways, 100 different ways now. And then they're also rushing to build more and more powerful computational devices as fast as they possibly can. And there's a huge arms race in that direction. And arms races, of course, well, they tend to, they tend to progress perhaps exponentially. And so all these things are happening at the same time. Well, we have no idea what that, we have no idea what that means. We are definitely increasing our technological power. And you can imagine that that'll increase our capacity for tyranny and also our capacity for abundance. And then the question becomes, what do we need to do in order to increase the probability that we tilt the future towards Jerusalem and away from the beast? And the reason that I've been concentrating on helping people bolster their individual morality to the degree that I've managed that is because I think that whether the outcome is the positive outcome that in some sense Jim has been outlining or the negative outcomes that we've been querying him about, I think that's going to be dependent on the individual ethical choices of people, well, at the individual level, but then cumulatively, right? So if we decide that we're gonna worship the image of the beast, so to speak, because we're mesmerized by our own reflection, that's another way of thinking about it, and we wanna be the victim of our own dark desires, then the IA revolution is gonna go very, very badly. AI. But if, if we decide that we're going to aim up in some positive way and we make the right micro decisions, well, then maybe we can harness this technology to produce a time of abundance in the manner that Jim is hopeful about. We don't even know if we need to be worried about Facebook because God only knows if it'll even exist in five years. It could even be the same with Google. So, we, you know, we're worried about machines that are changing so fast that we can't figure out what exactly we should be worried about. Because I mean, who was thinking about YouTube five years ago? No one, it's like cute cat videos. Who cares about YouTube? But it turns out that YouTube is an unbelievably powerful social force because it makes the spoken word as universally transmissible and as permanent as the written word, right? So it's a Gutenberg revolution. And it might even be more profound than Gutenberg revolution because it's possible that people can listen better than they can read. And they can listen when they're doing other things, which is what happens in the podcast world. And lots of my students now listen to podcasts instead of listening to music, or they listen to podcasts instead of reading. You know, they speed them up. I mean, these are massive, massive technological changes, and they're all happening in parallel. We have no idea what the consequences of that are going to be. The fact that any set of phenomena has a near infinite number of potential interpretations, and that actually happens to be the case. Uh, that, that fact, let's say, was discovered simultaneously in a number of different disciplines. Um, one of them, most surprisingly, was artificial intelligence, and the artificial intelligence people ran into that conundrum 
when they learned that it was much more difficult to make a machine that could perceive the world than had originally been supposed. You know, we were supposed to have autonomous robots and, or, and, and functional artificial intelligence back by the late 60s, and of course that didn't happen. And part of the reason for that was that the artificial intelligence researchers, when they were starting to instantiate perception into their machines, learned that charting your course in the world might be a trivial problem in comparison to determining how to perceive the world and the reason for that is that there's a very large number of ways to perceive the world. My concern fundamentally is that these machines will reflect us ethically and that should be frightening because I wouldn't say that our ethical house is particularly in order. So they're going to magnify what we are. You know, so, you know, the Google guys can talk about the mind of God, but that's making the presumption that the thing that we're building will be a good thing. And I don't think that it will be a good thing because it will reflect us.